We are not a monolith. We're not a monolith! But due to our shared diaspora, we will gather for those black folks excelling in the arts. Well, to support black cis men at least. Whenever there's a queer rapper, it's almost as if we relegate them to smaller venues and provide less support. You don't have to look that hard to see that gay rappers aren't pushed by Spotify or YouTube algorithms. Now I want to show some of these artists some love, so I probably won't be able to monetize this video. So if you wouldn't mind dropping a like or sharing, if you like it of course, I'd really appreciate it. Gay or otherwise queer rappers certainly get less promotion on hip hop podcasts and reaction channels. But there's a lot of fun music out there. In research for this video, I came across Kid Ken, an openly gay rapper that's been on the scene for a minute. Bad bitches on my body, that's what fly to me. I'm an Apple iPhone, you a Samsung Galaxy. Uh, chrome head to toe, for a bad cat to go. I got all this ice all on me, bitch, your head to snow. And from what I've listened to, he's better than half of the double XL freshmen have come out in the past few years. Whoops out the club with that shit tucked in. Okay, it costs about the dub for me to go club in. Okay, fast bars, fast cars, and my budget. Oh, and I'll still be on the block, bitches love it. Fresh away this time, watch his body for them. Hey, baby boy, watch his body crawling. Uh huh. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Hey. Then you have acts like Saucy Santana. Big bank, I get it. Cash out, no limit. Make him pass out when he hit it. And of course, you can't forget about Big Frida. <laughs> You better believe her, or you could just call me a worldwide diva. I had to show ya, you wouldn't believe her. But the fact is, a lot of men aren't comfortable enough with their own masculinity to even listen to music by an artist that's into other men. A lot of men still won't even listen to female rappers, but I just added Doshi or Dochi. I'm old, I don't know how it's pronounced yet. But I added her to my workout playlist. I'm on sleepy time, lizard jet out to Dubai, watching me like cutie pie, cash my check out to Dubai. Bitch, I see me on. And yo, when I'm on that treadmill, it's it's what gets me there in the morning. But why is a hip hop image not only masculine but hyper masculine? So much so that femme queer or otherwise non cis het men aren't given the same platform. And if they get a decent audience of women or queer folks, the upset old heteros view it as gay music. And I missed out on peak Lady Gaga because I was still in some closeted insecure shit, but I ain't missing out on Chapel Roan. She go hard and I'm finna bump some more Big Frida this weekend. But even in terms of rappers that present a proto-masculinity, one where style or dress or importance doesn't match standard ideals, there's still this focus on virility or engaging with the opposite sex in a way that says, hey, don't forget I'm straight. Using Tyler the Creator as a brief example, even his alleged queerness, he still maintains his harder edge, which I'm sure partially comes from age, but might be part balancing act faced by a lot of masculine, gay, or queer men. Now, Tyler is friends with Gerard Carmichael, who's a successful writer and comedian. Recently, Gerard had his own miniseries, a reality TV documentary ordeal with HBO Max or Max or whatever. And in the show, Gerard, who's an openly gay man, tries to have this moment with Tyler referring to an incident where Actually, just watch it. Is that I kind of felt like a distance between us. I have an idea of what it is, but what I think, what do you is, think that it is? is because I told you I had feelings for you and you, we didn't talk about it ever. That was like weird. I don't know if it was just too awkward to talk about or too. I don't know. I don't know. Like, it's just like, I feel like you left me hanging out there a little bit. Like, like when you said that, I think I replied with like something super mad, normal, regular, like. You laughed and called me a stupid bitch. I did. <laughs> yeah, I did. Mm -hmm. I did. Now, did you notice how Tyler reacted? It was almost as if he was thinking, damn, don't blow up my spot, man. But he also responds in a way as to not confirm his orientation, like there needs to be this balance in being openly queer and being associated with queerness. Tyler is associated with queerness. Any allusion to his sexuality has been responded to as a joke or as a throwaway rap bar. With was goofy and all mouses. Double C my luggage and fill him with comb blouses. Y'all cop cush, my nigga, I cop houses. And fill him with some Leo to cap some cold sprouses, nigga. Where we Which, again, if you drop those many rap bars alluding to you liking Twinks or Dylan or Cole Sprouse or DiCaprio or whoever, a little pretty white boy, you're gonna think you're gay, bruh.
But it's like Tyler's way of saying, I'm not queer, I'm Tyler. I'm not black, I'm OJ. Okay. The truth is, there are many gay men in hip hop living double lives. It's a statistical probability that at least half a dozen popular macho rappers are gay or queer aligning. I'm not saying any names because, again, I'm not getting sued for a YouTube video and also, outing people is just gross. I mean, I don't like DL dudes, but it's still their business, their choice to come out or not. But there have been stories, carefully redacted of course, that allude to men living gay lives. Hiding in hip hop on a down low in the entertainment industry from music to Hollywood is a memoir from Terrence Dean, a gay man that was working in a Los Angeles music scene in the 90s and early 2000s. In a book, there are some graphic accounts of intimacy between men and hip hop he participated in or witnessed. It's a pretty engaging read, which says a lot. Most memoirs suck. People get into these self-serving, self-filating diatribes that rarely tell you anything of true substance. But his story is reminiscent to that of a lot of queer black men trying to get a handle on his identity. In one passage, he reflects on an early part of his journey. I knew it was not a gay man. I generally fluctuated between down low and down low gay. Besides, I grew up in a church where I learned homosexuality is a sin. If you're gay, you die and go to hell. People hate you. God hates you. And who in their right mind would want God to hate them? And I'm wary of giving too much detail that could allude to who he was referring to within various trysts he participated or witnessed. That's really not my place. But what's fascinating is how often, or rather how it seems to have been relatively easy to find minds to engage with. As the story continues, he details meeting other down low men in hip hop and television and the most intriguing part is the support system involved. Now gay support circles run deep, don't ever underestimate the power of found families, and they're even expansive in realms where almost everyone is in a closet, so that part isn't what fascinated me. What got me is how the Hollywood machine with all its cynicism can still have enclaves of folk that look out for each other. You mix that in with some ingrained homophobia and you can see where the gay conspiracy theories come in. Especially the gay humiliation rituals, which is just the ashy cousin of emasculation of black men by putting in dresses theory. Essentially, it's all just root misogyny, the theory being that black men are emasculated in exchange for fame or fortune. There are hetero predators and obviously there are gay predators, but just because a lot of butch gay dudes in industry are on a down low, doesn't mean there's a grand conspiracy, it just means gay folks can be just as creepy as the straights. And for every queer allegation, you can come across at least half a dozen scandals surrounding hetero celebrities, so miss me with the BS. It's just what happens when needs intertwine, communities develop, and sometimes the communities suck. And I think the community that develops to help masculine gay men stay in the closet is pretty strong because, especially in hip hop, you have to maintain this hard edge. So it becomes a question of if you can be both gay and tough. Now the first masculine tough gay man on TV I saw was the character Omar from the hit HBO show The Wire. We were introduced to Omar and his team watching a hustling crew open market for the day. The immediate indication being that Omar and his crew will attempt to relieve the hustling crew of their product. Now Omar and his crew hit the stash spot. Now one of Omar's team accidentally says his real name out loud and Omar gives him a death glare. It's later revealed that Omar is in a romantic relationship with one of his two partners, a man named Brandon, the one that accidentally said his name out loud. Now Brandon, Omar's boyfriend, is caught lacking by the team they hit and well, by the time the audience next sees him, his body is laying across an abandoned car. This leads Omar on a quest for revenge. And I really liked Omar because regardless of how anyone felt, he did not hide who he was. He openly shared affection with his partner, hugging and kissing in broad daylight in the hood, which is very bold, especially in the early 2000s. Michael K. Williams, may you rest in peace, the actor who portrayed Omar said this in his memoir in regards to playing Omar. As for Omar's homosexuality, it was groundbreaking 20 years ago, and I admit that at first I was scared to play a gay character, Williams wrote. I remember helping my mother carry groceries to her apartment and telling her about the new role that I booked. I knew from the jump he was going to be a big deal. The character is going to change my career, I said, but the thing is, I hesitated, he's openly gay. I think my initial fear of Omar's sexuality came from my upbringing, the community that raised me and the stubborn stereotypes of gay characters. I made Omar my own, he wasn't written as a type and I wouldn't play him as one. And a lot of men, queer or straight, relate to the Omar character. That radical self-acceptance can be a powerful factor. 
but the power and temptation to pass is sometimes too enticing to pass up. The disconnect between identity and perception of that identity leads to a denial of self, which leads to the toxic masculinity, which is the ultimate reason why there's still so much issue in hip hop surrounding queer or non-traditionally presenting men. The primary reason for the disconnect between lifestyle and identification is that download men interpret being gay or bisexual as an upper class white male lifestyle. In other words, African American men on the down low do not compare themselves to white men who are openly gay or bisexual because they, white gay men, still benefit from white privilege regardless of their sexual orientation. Furthermore, the media, television, and movies continues to depict many white gay men as effeminate or jokes. Black masculinity is robustly connected with identity within the African American community. It's not possible to analyze black masculinity in America without acknowledging slavery and post-colonial violence suffered under those hands of former masters and those white neighbors who didn't want black folk to get uppity. And regardless of economic class, black men were subordinate to any class of white person. This put black males in a subordinate position. With respect to white male masculinity, it weakens black males through an act of subordination, setting them up as sex objects through either white men or white women. In either case, the slaves cannot be their own men, they are someone else's slaves. Now, Aurelis specifically uses the word slaves, but the correlation still stands behind it, even within the gendered and racial norms of white women and white men. But I made a whole video on a down low that you don't have to worry about watching. The audio was awful and it was just poor quality and I'm bringing up most of the same things right now. So just bear with me. Now the remnants of this slavery waft around like a putrid miasma offending the senses and the sensibilities of black folks. Their spores spreading like a contagion through the black community. It's a pathogen that follows empathy, reduces inertia, and hardens the exterior. It prevents us from cracking through a husk and thus helps leave our garden barren. To make any real progress as people, black folk must begin to center the issues of black cis and trans women and stop valuing feminine men as less than masculine presenting men. It's absurdity trying to maintain views surrounding masculine and feminine ideals when they shift every few decades. Toxic masculinity is a reflection on the impotent rage that a lot of men feel because the need to feel special in that way that only manly men feel, and in doing so feel the need to police the behavior of other men. The tacky no homo has been recently replaced with the no ditty and, again, the man's orientation should be the last thing discussed when comparing the rest of his crimes. There will always be detractors, but we can ignore the loud and vocal minority. They don't want to listen, but we can help by actively not engaging in the shenanigans. Right now, even amongst the traditionally masculine straight rappers, there are styles that would have been vilified 25 years ago, but at the same time right in line with hip-hop fashion 40 years ago. It's cyclical, just like every other style or facet of the cultural zeitgeist. Eventually what's acceptable now in terms of raw aesthetic and gender performance will be shifted. The little trivial things that get criticized now probably won't be a big deal anymore. Maybe pink will be a boy color again. Maybe we'll finally stop caring. But hopefully we continue to see progress being made in regards to the space queer artists are allowed to occupy in the hip hop landscape. Like it or not, there's a good chance that one of your favorite rappers is gay. So ask yourself this. If the person you're thinking about right now came out of the closet, how much would it actually change anything?